We are delighted to have uh, Dr. Akanksha Menon today. She is an assistant professor in uh, the Woodruff School of Mechanical Engineering at Georgia Tech, where she directs the Water and Energy Research Lab. Uh, before this position, she was a postdoctoral fellow uh, in the uh, Lawrence, Mer Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, working with Dr. Ravi Prasher. And uh, before that, she received her master's and PhD from Georgia Tech. Uh, her research focuses on applying thermal science and functional materials um, to sustainable energy technologies for the water energy nexus. She is a recipient of the uh, 2023 NSF Career Award, uh, 2022 DARPA Riser, and a class of 1969 teaching fellow. Um, she was also recognized as an emerging talent in the 2020 Falling Walls Breakthrough of the Year, and she was featured by the U.S. Department of Energy in their Women at Energy Initiative. Uh, today, Dr. Menon will be talking, us, talking to us about thermally responsive materials for the water energy, energy nexus. Floor is all yours. Great. Thank you so much for the introduction, Bikram. And uh, thank you to Mateo and Mohammed for the invitation to speak uh, at the Thermal Transport Cafe. Um, so as Bikram said, today I'll be focusing on discussing the work we've done related to using thermally responsive materials for the water and energy nexus. Uh, so it's a subset of the different things that my group uh, works on. So first I thought I'll just uh, talk about that. So we are the Water Energy Research Lab. Um, this is my finishing up my second year at Georgia Tech, so still uh, building things up as we go. Uh, but primarily on the water side, we're focusing on uh, desalination technologies that can harness solar energy uh, as heat for the desalination process. Um, and then we're mainly interested in doing desalination of uh, complex multi-component solutions. And so that allows us to get to what's called zero liquid discharge. Um, so I'll be discussing some of our work in this space. Uh, we can also do resource recovery as part of desalination. You can selectively extract elements or salts of interest. And this is where surface modification actually becomes quite uh, important. So I'll briefly touch upon that as well. Uh, we also work on some hybrid separation, so where we combine a membrane and a, and a thermal process, and I'll, I'll talk about some of our work uh, in that space. On the energy side, mainly what we focus on is thermal energy storage, um, so storing energy as heat and releasing it as uh, heat at different temperatures. Uh, so a lot of work that we're doing is focused on thermal storage for buildings, and I'll talk about that in today's talk. So that's temperatures below 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, we also have some collaborative projects where we're working on very high temperature thermal storage. So this is, you know, over 1000 degrees Celsius and mainly for industrial processes. So, for example, for steel, uh, iron and steel or cement, how can we provide the heat that they require for those processes? Um, so we work on some high temperature storage concepts. Uh, some of the ideas we have for desalination also lend uh, themselves well to dehumidification. Um, so I'll briefly mention that as well. And so this allows us to really separate the latent load um, from the cooling load itself, uh, which can be very beneficial for air conditioning. Uh, and then more recently, we've started a project on using natural materials and natural fibers as um, insulation materials for buildings. So the idea of using natural fibers is that um, they can be carbon sequestering. And so you could have insulation and structural materials in buildings that are uh, carbon negative. So what ties all of this together is thermal science and functional materials. And so this is really the, the umbrella um, that we uh, work under. So let me start off by talking about why do we care about desalination? Um, why is water becoming uh, such an important uh, challenge, right? So one of the, the big things is that if we look at the global water demand, 
uh, in just the next two decades, it's going to increase by 55%, right? So looking at this bar graph here, you see by the end of this decade, 2030, about half the global population will be experiencing severe water stress. And when we look at where that water stress is going to be, you see that it sort of is across the globe, right? So this is showing the ratio of how much of our naturally available freshwater resources we're withdrawing. And so as we get to these darker shades of orange and red, that shows that we've withdrawn or will be consuming more than 80% of our existing freshwater reserves. And so this is what is projected to lead to significant water stress. And that's why we need to develop uh, new ways of producing uh, fresh water. And when we think about water, it's not just for portable use, right? That is actually one of the smallest um, use cases. Uh, so if we look at the Sankey diagram and follow water uh, on its journey, so starting here, this is our freshwater um, sources, and we see that a majority of it is used for agriculture and for cooling our thermoelectric power plants, right? So these are the two biggest consumers of freshwater. And then we have um, smaller amounts that are used for public use as well as um, for industrial processes. Most of the water consumed in agriculture is lost, right? So it's either taken up by the plants we grow or it's evaporated. Uh, but if we look at all the other water, especially from uh, power plants and these other uses, all of that is just discharged, right? A very small amount of it is actually treated. And so this is a very linear consumption model where we go from water at its source and then we consume it, dispose it. Uh, but as we're experiencing water stress, um, there is a lot of interest in looking at, instead of discharging this, can we treat and reuse the water for a lot of these processes? And so this is where desalination um, is, is an important technology. Uh, so what is desalination? Right, so at its core, it's this, you can think of it just as a black box separator. You could have a membrane-based process or a thermal um, process where you have your salt water that comes in, you apply some energy, and you can then separate it into clean water. The challenge is that you can never do 100% recovery of the fresh water because the amount of pressure that you would need in a membrane process or the amount of um, heat that you would have to put into a thermal process exponentially increases, right? So oftentimes we only operate, for example, for seawater desalination, we'll only recover about 50% of the water. And then you're left with this 50% that now has twice as much the salt concentration. So we call that the brine. And so what you see is that as desalination grows, that means the amount of brine that is also going to be produced as a byproduct of desalination is also going to um, significantly increase. And currently, 99% of desalination is just driven by fossil fuels, right? So that's why we're interested in looking at how can we use solar energy um, to drive a desalination process. So what do we do with the brine? So currently, mostly what we end up doing is we dispose it. Um, so if you're doing ocean water desalination, you will discharge the brine back into the ocean. Um, there are some other ways of disposing the brine as well, depending on what concentration it's at. Uh, but especially as you get to higher salinities, discharging or disposing the brine is a major challenge uh, because it has impacts, environmental impacts. And so we're more interested in looking at how can we take the brine and treat it further. And so that leads us to what's referred to as zero liquid discharge. Okay, so we take the brine and treat it to recover, let's say, 95% of the water. And that 5% um, slurry that's left um, could then be evaporated or crystallized and disposed in a landfill. So that allows us to get to zero liquid discharge. So why don't we just do zero liquid discharge? Um, the main reason for this is 
the energy consumption, right? So here I'm showing you the specific energy consumed. So how many kilowatt hours of electricity um, is required to produce a cubic meter of clean water? And that changes as a function of the salt content in the water. And we see that a lot of seawater desalination technologies fall right around here. Um, so specific energy consumptions, membrane processes are more efficient uh, than our thermal processes. But as we go to higher salinities, which is what we would need to treat the brine, you see this significant jump in the energy consumption. And so because of this, uh, there hasn't been much work uh, on doing brine concentration. So one of the things uh, when I initially started working in this area was just looking at if we're doing evaporation, which is what ultimately you end up needing to do to get rid of um, the, the last bit of water, uh, why not just do evaporation under natural sunlight, right? So actually a lot of uh, industries use what's called evaporation ponds, where they allow the uh, the water to evaporate under natural sunlight. So this is what it would look like. You have sunlight coming in uh, to your man-made pond, which could, contains the brine you're trying to uh, evaporate. Uh, the issue with just using natural sunlight is that the efficiency is very low. Right, so when you take just natural sunlight, uh, the brine does not strongly absorb it, uh, and we know that water is pretty transparent at solar wavelengths. So you end up with, you know, solar to vapor conversion efficient efficiencies of less than twenty percent. On top of that, you know, the process is very time consuming. So typically, you have to leave this for a year, year and a half in an evaporation pond um, to get rid of. Uh, the water. This is how lithium is also extracted, uh, right? It's the same uh, process in the salt lakes in South America. So we were thinking about, okay, how can we evaporate um, water more efficiently under natural sunlight? Um, and right around this time is when there was a lot of work on solar steam generation um, and solar um, vapor generation. Uh, a lot of it which came out of uh, Professor Gang Chen's group at MIT. Uh, and essentially the idea was evaporation is just a surface uh, phenomena, so let us localize the heat at the surface. And that would increase the temperature of that surface, and that would um, enhance the evaporation rate. And so there have been you know, hundreds of papers on photothermal evaporation since then. Uh, with this idea of interfacial heat localization. Uh, all of those concepts pretty much comprise of some sort of a porous absorber. So it has a very high absorptivity across the um, solar wavelengths. So you can take in sunlight and then you have an insulating um, foam underneath it to prevent the heat from going into the bulk of the water. So you're again just localizing the heat at the surface. And then you can add a wick to deliver the water to the top of that surface. Right. So I think this community is probably very familiar with uh, the work that's happened in the space. Uh, and several prototypes have been demonstrated primarily with uh, seawater. Um, and continuous operation uh, really does end up uh, having a lot of salt precipitation because you're working with these very porous um, absorber and insulation materials. And so our approach was uh, to do the same photothermal evaporation, but um, without this contact. And so for that, what we can do is just leverage the inherent properties that water has. So if we look at the absorption coefficient of water, um, at different wavelengths, uh, we see that absorption is very low in the across the solar uh, range. And what we notice is that as you go to higher wavelengths, so especially around the mid infrared, we see this uh, dramatic increase, right? Sev several orders of magnitude jump in the absorption coefficient of water. So if we're able to get um, wavelengths around the mid infrared, then the penetration depth corresponding to that is a few tens of microns. 
So we should be able to absorb all of the infrared within a few uh, micron thick uh, layer of water. So using this, again, inherent property that water has, um, we developed uh, a photothermal converter that'll take us from the visible to the infrared, right? And so um, call it a solar umbrella. So it takes in sunlight. You have a selective solar absorber uh, on top, which has a very high absorb absorptivity at the solar wavelengths, but a very low emissivity uh, in the infrared. And so all of the solar radiation that's strongly absorbed uh, cannot be emitted um, back. And so it really just uh, starts heating up. And then on the bottom, what we have is an infrared emitter. Um, so in this case, just started with a black body emitter, uh, which as it heats up is going to start emitting uh, in the infrared. So as we get close to about 100 degrees Celsius, we're in that eight to 10 microns, uh, which is exactly the wavelength range where water has this big jump. And so what we see is uh, because of this photothermal conversion, um, we get surface heating. So we're able to localize the heat, but you notice that it's completely non-contact uh, because we're just relying on radiation heat transfer. So this is very beneficial uh, because we don't have to worry about any um, any of the salts precipitating uh, within the pores. So here are some of the experimental uh, results. So again, you can see um, from this infrared image, uh, the heat is localized at the evaporation surface. Uh, the bulk of the solution remains more or less close to ambient temperature, uh, but the surface temperature increases uh, about 20 degrees Celsius uh, because of this heat localization. And you can track the evaporation rate. Uh, and here you see that with the solar umbrella, uh, we get the steep increase in the evaporation rate um, because again, the, the temperature of the surface is higher. And if you run this, um, let this run for a few hours, um, at the end, you're able to evaporate uh, all the water. And you're left with, uh, in this case, this is sodium chloride because we ran a saturated sodium chloride um, solution. And you're left with these salts that crystallize um, out or precipitate out. And so we showed um, that you can do this uh, non-contact um, heating and evaporation to get to zero liquid discharge, uh, just using uh, solar energy, but converting it to the infrared. And we can quantify like an overall uh, efficiency for this process and break it up into uh, three components. So one is how good is your solar absorber itself? Um, so here we get uh, a really good efficiency. 90% of sunlight coming in is converted into heat. Uh, then comes how much of that heat is actually transferred to the surface of the water itself. Um, so here, your view factor for radiation becomes important. So we were a little um, under uh, the optimal value. And then finally, how much of the heat that's actually incident on the water surface um, is going to be used for evaporation versus conduction to the bulk, right? So there, um, that's where we have significant losses by conduction to the bulk. So overall, it's about 43% efficient, um, but Again, by tweaking some of these efficiencies, you can increase uh, the overall solar to vapor conversion to about 70%. Uh, and it's completely non-contact and acts uh, just passively. Uh, so this was a very um, simple demonstration of how can we get to zero liquid discharge just using um, natural sunlight. But in this process, there's no vapor being captured and condensed to produce clean water, right? So this is more of just a disposal uh, mechanism in order to get to zero liquid discharge, but you're not capturing and reusing uh, the water itself uh, because it's very limited by the condensation step. And so what we've been working on more recently, so this is work um, that is ongoing in my group, uh, is we're developing what we call 
air gap diffusion distillation. So it is a distillation process. So there's going to be evaporation and condensation, uh, but it is at ambient pressure. And so the way it works is we have a condenser through which our water can flow up. Some external heat uh, can be added to that um, water, and then it's introduced on top of this evaporator surface. And so as this heated fluid flows down the evaporator surface, uh, the vapor is going to it's going to evaporate and the vapor is going to transport across this gap and it'll condense on the outer surface of the condenser. So in this manner, as it condenses, that latent heat uh, of condensation is now being recovered and reused to preheat the fluid that was flowing up. So we're able to recover and reuse um, the latent heat. And at the end, what comes out is your brine because we've evaporated water and the condensate film that forms is the permeate itself. And so the driving force is just vapor pressure, a vapor pressure difference across uh, this air gap. And so we would have to optimize this air gap uh, width in order to uh, optimize your heat conduction as well as your mass transfer resistance. So if some of you are familiar with membrane distillation, uh, this is similar, it all thermodynamically very similar, but there is no membrane in the process. We're just using uh, the air gap. It's just an air gap itself. Uh, so that really helps us eliminate any kind of scaling that could happen on or within the pores of the, the membrane. Uh, because again, we're trying to get to these very high salinities. And as I mentioned, we're able to do heat recovery so that you can reduce the amount of external heat that you have to add uh, into this system. As the uh, fluid flows down the evaporator surface, you could get um, some salts that precipitate on that surface over time. Uh, so it's also important to look at how can we modify the evaporator surface in order to minimize salt precipitation or to minimize the salt adhesion to the surface. Uh, so this is uh, my student, Walter, who's working on this project. And the first step was to develop a coupled heat and mass transport model uh, to come up with the uh, performance metrics for this air gap diffusion distillation or AGDD uh, system to do brine concentration. Uh, so we can use a simple resistor network for this. Uh, so you have your fluid flowing through the condenser, um, the convection resistance associated with it, and then you have the condenser plate itself, so conduction resistance there, and then conduction through the uh, permeate film that's forming, and then the conduction through the air gap, um, or the resistance through the air gap, which is both heat conduction um, as well as uh, the mass transport itself, so the latent heat moving from one side to the other, and then on the hot side, um, again, with the thin film, there would be a convection resistance associated with it. Uh, so we can just model it as this simple resistor network to capture both the heat and mass transport um, happening within this system. Um, and for the in the interest of time, I'm not going through you know the step by step process, but just directly jumping to show you some of the results that we've been getting. Uh, so this is now looking at the temperature profile on both the evaporator side and the condenser side as a function of uh, the length of the system itself. And uh, we were looking at a one one meter length um, device uh, with a width of about 0.2 meters and an air gap uh, thickness of three millimeters. Um, and this is based on an optimization uh, that we looked at. And so we see our hot fluid, so on the evaporator side, um, it's cooling down as it flows uh, through the device and the cold fluid is picking up that heat and heating up, again, because we have this counterflow 
um, arrangement. So it looks very much like the temperature profile from a counterflow heat exchanger. So um, that was, you know, just a good sanity check. And then we can look at the two performance metrics that matter. Um, so that is how much water uh, do we produce? So the flux uh, of the permeate and what we call the gained output ratio. So for a given amount of um, heat, how much is the mass that you're producing? So this is essentially uh, a measure of how many times you're recovering the latent heat. So if you were just evaporating and condensing, you would have a GOR of one or less. And if you're doing heat recovery, you're, you can get to these gained output ratios that are much higher. Uh, but we see this trade-off, which uh, again is very common in all thermal desalination uh, processes and membrane distillation as well, uh, where if you want a very high permeate flux, uh, you have to sacrifice your efficiency. Or if you're really looking at trying to maximize your heat recovery, you end up um, sacrificing how much permeate you can produce. And so we've looked at different salinities. So S here is showing you different starting salinities um, going up to like 160 grams per kilogram. One challenge in going to salinities above this is we don't really have good correlations for how a lot of the um, thermophysical properties change um, at higher salinities. So that's something we're um, trying to, to dig into some more. Uh, but overall, what we see is there is this optimum. And so depending on exactly what conditions you're looking uh, to run, you would have to optimize um, your system itself. And talking about um, as we get to these higher and higher salinities, as I mentioned, we also have to address the fact that salts will start precipitating. Um, so here at 160 grams per kilogram, you should already have a lot of calcium sulfates that have precipitated out. And as we get closer to 200 grams per kilogram, that's where we start seeing sodium chloride um, precipitating out. Um, so we looked at the literature on what's been done uh, with salt precipitation, which is uh, not very much, uh, but a lot of work that had been done in the condensation literature for superhydrophobic surfaces uh, can be borrowed. Um, so initially we looked at um, how can we get the sort of behavior uh, that we call water roll off. Um, so you're not getting the water to really stick on the surface and as a result the salts won't precipitate. Um, so you can do that with superhydrophobic surfaces. Uh, and then uh, from uh, Professor Kripa Varanasi's group at MIT, they'd shown this interesting um, effect that if you have these nanostructured surfaces that are heated, even if your salt crystals form, they start, um, they create these legs and eject themselves off the surface uh, because of this nanostructured um, surface that exists under the salt. So we thought about using um, some of these effects and essentially, you know, designing a surface that, so it would be a heated surface because this is um, the brine flowing down the evaporator. Uh, if you have just microstructures, like, you know, simple pillars, um, you're not going to get these effects. And so we were looking at, okay, if you add additional um, nanoscale um, surfaces, then you really can minimize that contact area. And so we did several experiments looking at many different types of nanostructured surfaces. But the biggest difference from literature is that we were working with um, multi-component salt solutions. So in this example that I showed you here, where these legs form, that's just sodium chloride. Um, but if you actually have sodium chloride, you have calcium sulfate, and even if you have like silica, which again is very common in desalination waters, then you don't see these effects anymore. Um, so then we looked at, okay, what other types of superhydrophobic surfaces um, have been shown in the literature? Uh, so there's the commercial never wet coating. You can just spray it onto surfaces. Um, there's a lot of work on silane-based coatings and quasi-liquid surfaces or liquid-infused surfaces. 
um, which this community is very familiar with. And I know um, from a lot of the recent talks, uh, we've talked about durability challenges. Uh, but not much has been studied in terms of like durability of these coatings uh, for desalination applications, because most of it was uh, for condensation. So we did um, some durability studies looking at silane quasi-liquid surfaces and never wet in uh, hot salt water environments. And we see that for the first couple of hours, um, these coatings hold up okay, but even beyond 12 hours, we see significant degradation, right? So this is an example of the never wet coating where you get this really nice high super uh, high contact angle, um, super hydrophobic, uh, and it maintains it in just water. But as soon as you have uh, hot water and salt, uh, that's where we start to see uh, that loss in the contact angle um, or wetting changing. And a lot of the drop droplet um, evaporation or drop phase condensation experiments uh, do not directly translate to its use in air gap diffusion distillation uh, because we're looking very much at um, a film flowing down a surface. And so uh, what we've, from a lot of these studies, what we um, decided to then do is just look at um, scaling on surfaces. So if this is uh, a photo of the experimental setup. We have uh, different substrates which are sitting uh, vertically uh, in a salt solution. Again, these are multi-component salt solutions, and we allow the water to evaporate and uh, look at what scale has formed on the surface itself. And so the majority of the precipitation we really see is calcium sulfate. Um, again, it comes out uh, very quickly, and you can see these uh, nice uh, crystals that it forms on the surface. So we looked at these more traditional um, slippery surfaces, and then we looked at uh, just using a hydrophobic polymer like PTFE, right? So no coating, just a hydrophobic um, PTFE. And we can look at after salt pre precipitation, how much actually builds up on these different substrates. And so here you can see um, that in the case of the silane, we get the maximum um, salt that forms. So then we can put it back into deionized water and try to dissolve uh, away that salt. Uh, or you could even very easily remove the salt in the case of PTFE, it just comes right off the surface. There's very little adhesion. Uh, so we also looked at the contact angle after we put it into deionized water. So it really should dissolve the salt. So initially PTFE is around 110 uh, degrees. And after scaling, and then we descale it, uh, it maintains that contact angle fairly well. Uh, whereas for the silane and the QLS, we see uh, much bigger drops in the contact angle, um, even after removing uh, the salt from the surface. And so really what uh, we've found is we can just work with hydrophobic polymers rather than these coated surfaces. And we've done this with PEAK and PVDF as well and see very similar results where these inherently hydrophobic uh, polymers give you um, stable performance and also very low adhesion of the salt to the surface. And so these are um, the these would be suitable as our evaporator surface for the air gap diffusion distillation uh, system. Uh, but to this community, I would say, you know, if there are other coatings um, that are of interest, I think durability is something that really just has to be uh, nailed down because anything above 12 hours, we start to see significant drops in the performance, especially in the presence of uh, salt. So, so far I talked a lot about evaporative processes um, where we're inherently limited by the, the large latent heat of vaporization that water has, right? So that's around um, 600 kilowatt hours um, thermal per cubic meter. And if we compare that with thermodynamically, what is the amount of energy needed to separate salt from water? 
uh, we can look at the Gibbs free energy um, of mixing. And this depends on the concentration of the salt in the water, uh, but it's on the order of one to 10 kilowatt hours per cubic meter uh, to go from uh, seawater uh, up to about 200 grams per kilogram, so close to the saturation limit of sodium chloride. So there's a big difference here, right? So this is kilowatt hour electric, but even if this was thermal, there still is a significant difference in how much energy you really need for a separation versus how much energy a thermal process requires when you're using uh, evaporation. And so we've also been looking at non-evaporative phase transitions. So one example is this process referred to as forward osmosis. So in forward osmosis, you have your wastewater um, that you're trying to purify on one side of a membrane. And on the other side, you have a more concentrated solution that we call the draw. Because it has a higher concentration, it is going to draw water across this water permeable membrane in order to equalize um, the chemical potentials on both sides. And so you don't have to input any external energy. You can naturally draw water across the membrane because you've started with a higher concentration on one side, but you don't get clean water, right? So you still have to take now this diluted draw and separate it in order to get your clean water and then you can recycle um, the draw. Uh, so this is where we're working with these thermally responsive ionic liquids, uh, which exhibit a really interesting phase behavior. Uh, so this is what the phase uh, diagram looks like. You have this two-phase boundary, uh, which at some critical temperature, if you hit the two-phase boundary, you now go from a single homogeneous mixture to two phases that are immiscible. Uh, so here's what that looks like. Uh, for water with ionic liquid. Uh, this is just dyed with uh, a blue dye to show you the difference because the ionic liquids are also um, uh, transparent like water. And so at room temperature, it forms a single phase mixture, but as you heat it, uh, you get these two distinct phases and the ionic liquids that we work with are denser than water, so they settle at the bottom and the water floats on top. And so this is referred to as a lower critical solution temperature or LCST um, transition, and it's a liquid-liquid uh, phase separation. And the reason for this LCST behavior is that uh, when you mix the two, um, the two fluids in this case, normally your entropy goes up. But for these particular uh, materials, the entropy ends up decreasing. So you get a negative um, entropy of mixing when you put these together because they form a more ordered hydrogen bonded network. And the big benefit is that the enthalpy of this separation um, can be very, very small. And so you need to provide only a small amount of energy in order to go from the single phase uh, to the two phase. So this is where um, we're interested in leveraging this liquid-liquid phase separation uh, in order to do desalination. Uh, so here it gets into the chemistry of the ionic liquids uh, themselves. Uh, and so these are just some examples of essentially the salts that we work with, large organic salts. And so there is a, a cation and uh, the anion, and they have a balance of hydrophobic and hydrophilic functional groups. And at low temperatures, the hydrophilic uh, groups dominate, whereas as we increase temperature, the hydrophobic contribution comes into play, and that's how you get that phase separation. Uh, so this project, my student uh, Mofuz is currently working on, uh, where we characterize the osmotic strength uh, of these ionic liquids as a function of concentration. And then depending on what type of water we're interested in treating, 
So for example, for seawater, you would pick a concentration corresponding to that. And as we go to higher and higher concentrated solutions produced water from oil and gas, for example, we would need to work with very high concentration ionic liquid water mixtures. Uh, we can also characterize the phase diagram itself. Um, so this is experimental data showing you again that single phase, uh, but above some critical temperature, we can get to uh, the two phases. And for each ionic liquid, this uh, phase diagram uh, looks a little bit different. And higher up in temperature you go, the better your separation ends up being. So even though just 35 degrees Celsius may be enough, um, you will still, you won't get a very pure water phase. There will be ionic liquid in it. Uh, so you really have to go to higher temperatures to get uh, the two phases to have better separation. Uh, this is what the actual uh, phase separation itself looks like. So here, starting with a single phase uh, mixture, as we heat it up, we start to see this clouding um, of the mixture that happens. And then ultimately, you get to uh, the cloud point, where you go from this very transparent um, to a highly scattering uh, mixture. And then if you allow uh, this to just clear up, you start to see this phase boundary uh, that forms. And you can see uh, the transport of the two phases. Uh, so we get our water-rich phase on top, and the ionic liquid-rich phase um, settles at the bottom because its density is higher. And so we can use uh, this in order to we can actually characterize exactly at what temperature this happens using a transmittance measurement. And we see as a function of uh, concentration, so this is a low concentration, the transmittance goes from 100%, the clear solution to this cloudy at this temperature, so that is the cloud point temperature. As we go to the higher concentrations, this cloud point uh, also increases. Um, so this is, uh, just a zoomed in image of the actual of this vial right here. And you can see uh, we see phases, the coalescence of these little um, droplets within each phase, and then the two um, phases separated by uh, this phase boundary itself. So we think the mechanism that's at play is you have. Um, you know, small droplets of one phase in the larger phase, as you increase temperature, you're allowing these to coalesce. And once you get to some critical size, you're able to get uh, these macroscopic uh, two phases um, with temperature. And so we're looking at uh, the how the interfacial surface tension changes, um, as well as really trying to study the kinetics of this process. Uh, in order to speed it up, because we want the phase separation to happen quickly, and we also want the phase separation to be as complete as possible. So that's something we're currently uh, working on optimizing. Um, so most of that was the work that we're doing uh, on the water side. So I wanted to also very quickly mention some of the things we're doing related to energy uh, storage, which again combines um, thermal science and functional materials. Uh, the reason why we care about energy storage is if we look at our energy consumption overall, about 50% of energy consumption is in the form of heat. And most of that is in buildings as well as industrial processes. And 90% of that heat is just produced from fossil fuels, right? So there is uh, this need to decarbonize uh, heating. And if we look specifically at buildings and we look at all the energy use in a building, we see that um, space heating and water heating uh, consume significant amounts of energy, uh, about 60%. Uh, so that's where if we can have thermal energy storage that can provide space heating or hot water heating loads, then we would be able to significantly lower the um, carbon footprint of buildings. So that's the main motivation for looking at thermal energy storage. Um, I think a lot of people in this community are working on thermal storage, uh, so I don't really have to get into the different types. 
Uh, but what I want to emphasize is that we are mainly focused on thermochemical energy storage. Um, and so this is energy that's stored in the heat of reaction itself. Uh, and the main motivation for that is you can get very high energy densities. So to store about 10 gigajoules, uh, because of the high volumetric energy densities, we would need a significantly smaller footprint um, for thermal storage using thermochemical reactions. And uh, we work with the solid gas thermochemical reactions. So it's essentially a salt that can have different forms of uh, different hydrates. So you can dehydrate the salt and that process is endothermic. So that's your charging reaction where you're removing the water uh, molecules. And then when you want to recover the energy, you would need to introduce um, water vapor to the salt and that reaction ends up being exothermic. The hydration is exothermic, so that's where you can release heat for your building application. And so the idea would be to use um, solar energy or grid electricity to charge your thermal storage uh, when that energy is available. And then when you need it uh, at night, for example, that's when you would discharge your packed bed of this thermal storage, and that would produce that exothermic reaction would produce heat uh, that you could then use for the building application. Um, so because we're at temperatures below 100 degrees Celsius, our materials are the salt hydrates, uh, but people have looked at thermochemical storage with oxides, for example, or carbonates at higher temperatures. Uh, the big challenge is we want the reaction to be the solid gas transition where the water just enters the crystal lattice itself, right? So we want it to go from this to water that's accommodated in the crystal lattice. Uh, but in reality, um, we end up getting all sorts of other things uh, that happen in the reaction. So here's you know some of these salts, and you can see that if the Relative humidity, for example, is too high, you would get deliquescence of the salt, so it'll form a salt solution. Or if you're at too high of a temperature, then you would just get melting um, of the salt itself. So in all of these cases, we're losing this solid gas reaction because we've formed, because of these phase changes uh, that make the reaction reversibility very challenging. Uh, so my student, Eric, is working on characterizing these thermochemical um, salt hydrates, mainly by understanding the conditions under which they can be operated um, without these instabilities. And so the we can use the clausius clapeyron equation um, to capture the reaction itself. And um, the enthalpy of reaction is the storage capacity, which is what we care about. And that depends on the uh, vapor pressure and temperature uh, that your reaction is under. So this is what the clausius clapeyron equation looks like for uh, one of the salts we work with, which is strontium bromide. Uh, it exists in the anhydrous form, monohydrate, as well as hexahydrate. And so these curves tell us exactly what temperatures and pressures we need to be at. And then we can also look at the deliquescence line, which tells us um, the conditions that we don't want to operate at, because that's where you would form your salt solution. Now, if we look at uh, conditions um, right around here, where the salt should exist as the hexahydrate, uh, we see that there still is this significant impact of the pressure itself. So even though we're at conditions above the phase diagram, or above the phase boundary, if it's a low relative humidity, the salt barely gets to its fully hydrated state. So it's extremely slow as it hydrates. Whereas as we're at 60% relative humidity, it increases significantly. Um, so this really suggests that there is very much a region around this um, phase diagram where the hydration reaction is significantly lim uh, kinetically limited. So even though thermodynamically it looks favorable from the phase diagram, we can see that it's extremely slow. 
uh, or in some cases does not even completely hydrate. Uh, so we're trying to characterize what these regions are around um, the phase diagram where these kinetic limitations exist. Um, just really quickly then, I'll also talk about uh, the fact that particle size has a big impact. So this is what the salt looks like uh, in its pristine form. And we looked at ball milling it. So really milling it down into particles that are much smaller. So down to about um, 50 microns and less. And then we can do a dehydration as well as hydration. And then we see that when we work with the ball mill salts, the dehydration and the hydration reactions are much quicker. Um, so we're increasing the kinetics of the process, and then we also are able to get um, these transition temperatures to be a lot lower than what would be needed for the bulk salt. And again, that's mainly because we're creating this extra surface area uh, to allow the vapor to diffuse uh, in and out of the salt. And as a result, we're able to get uh, much higher energy densities, especially for hydration. Uh, so these are some of the considerations uh, that we're keeping in mind um, to optimize the performance of the salt. And so finally, uh, what we found is that, so there are two timescales that matter, the diffusion of the vapor uh, to the salt itself, and then the time scale for the reaction um, itself. And we see uh, from a lot of our TGA data, uh, we can extract the reaction rates. And we see that those reaction rates are actually pretty quick. Um, so it's the diffusion of the vapor into uh, this salt structure itself that is limiting a lot of these reactions. Uh, so currently, we're working on developing composites, which have this uh, highly porous um, network around the salts. So your salts are contained either in this encapsulated uh, matrix, or you could have a very porous shell um, that the salts are forced into. So we impregnate the salt uh, into this shell. And these composite structures have are optimized to have uh, high porosity uh, in order to allow for your heat and mass transfer, and at the same time prevent the salt from uh, leaving. Uh, so you don't get the salt washout or you don't get uh, salt agglomeration, which are some of the challenges uh, with the stability of these salts. And so with that, um, I would just like to acknowledge uh, the rest of my research groups. I only highlighted a couple of uh, projects that we're working on, uh, but this is the rest of the group. And I uh, want to acknowledge um, funding as well. The Thermal Chemical Storage Project is currently funded by uh, the NSF. Uh, and thank you all for listening, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, uh, thank you so much for a very wonderful talk. Um, if anyone has questions, they can uh, raise your hand, jump in, uh, unmute yourself and ask a question, or you can also put your question in the chat. Uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Mateo, you have a question? Yeah, um, thank you for this uh, wonderful talk. Um, I'm wondering about the durability of the hydrophobic coatings that you mentioned. Um, especially in the air gap uh, processes. Uh, what about the fluorinated uh, coatings, not, not silanes, like FDPA or something like this? Do you have uh, experience about that? No, so we have only directly worked with fluorinated polymers rather than a coating on a substrate. But that's something we would be interested in exploring. Yeah, because... Um, I, I realized that the, the coatings for durable dropwise condensation are being investigated a lot, uh, of course, and uh, this is somehow in line with uh, with what you do, right? I mean, in terms of durability. Right. Yeah, I think uh, it would be of interest uh, to study some of these fluorinated coatings. One of the things we've noticed when we work with 
coatings uh, is if the coating, the way it's deposited, right? Even if you have like little pinholes, that is a site for the salt to get in. And the salt can over time then cause your coating to delaminate from the surface. So I think we would need to ensure the coating is, you know, very conformal um, and is very stable in not just the heated environment, but in the presence of the, the salt itself. Mm -hmm. And maybe just a follow up here on this air gap uh, application. What is the um, how does the, the the structure looks like? It is that is like it's like made of two um, metal plates uh, with an air gap, or how how is it realized in, in so reality? We're, yeah, right now we're actually working with because of what I showed you with durability. We're working with uh, polymer surfaces uh, rather than with metal um, surfaces. So on our condenser side, it's just it's a channel. Um, so the fluid flows into this channel. On the evaporator side, it's just a thin uh, sheet of the polymer, and uh, the fluid flows on the outside of the surface. Yeah. Okay. So the the flow here is not stratified or something. It's like laminar flow. Correct. It is laminar flow. Only at, I mean, depending on what flow rate you're running at, but all the results I showed you for is just laminar flow. Uh, but if you do try to get much higher um, permeates, permeate fluxes, you have to go to higher flow rates and then you could be turbulent. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, Bikram, I have a, I have a question if you uh, yeah, don't mind. First of all, I really I have to say I really enjoyed it. It was um, new, new topics for me, and uh, I can I can say I learned I learned a lot from from your talk. Now, um, among the different questions I have, uh, one relates to the uh, conversion efficiency in the vaporization uh, uh, of water. Right, you mm -hmm. mentioned sixty three percent, and you mentioned that. Uh, uh, this is due to uh, con convective conducted losses towards the bulk of the fluid, I suppose. Right. Um, and, you know, did you ever think about uh, adding uh, materials uh, under the free surface of water to block these losses? Yeah, and so that's a lot of, like, these initial prototypes, right? That's what they were doing, right? Okay. Uh, because they would have the absorbable material and then they would have this foam below yeah. it right yeah. and that foam did exactly what you're mentioning which is it would isolate that surface from the bulk mm -hmm. but the foam still has to be porous to bring to allow your or you still have to have a wick to bring the water to the surface so because we wanted to avoid any kind of mechanism where there's contact between you know porous solid and the salt solution, that's why we weren't able to isolate uh, the water free surface from the bulk. Okay, can you clarify once again why you don't want contact? I mean, I, I, I don't say that you should do it uh, that way, but uh, I was thinking about something much simpler than this, actually. Okay. Like, like uh, you know, a, something which has a we will, which would have a neutral buoyancy so that basically it will float uh, uh, slightly below the free surface of water. A couple of okay. So, but what was the problem of contact other than you know I presume scalability cost and all the other things from from a from a thermochemical point of view is there any issue? So the only issue with contact is if you wanted if you were using that insulation surface also to like water still has to come up yeah the top surface right it does so look how is, yeah. yeah so when the water is actually transporting through to come to that top surface that's where you can get precipitation within that structure especially because we're working in this very you know salt heavy environment Okay, it's very cool. Give me a lot of ideas, to be honest. I'm not, I'm not, aware, I'm not acknowledgeable in this area. But, uh, the other question I have for you is more generic. It's really curiosity. Is, um, mm -hmm. uh, in the, the matter of uh, uh, energy storage, yeah. what is considered the, um, 
commercial target. For instance, in uh, in uh, dollars per uh, per uh, unit energy. Uh, so, like DOE has a target cost in dollars per kilowatt hours uh, of I think five dollars per kilowatt hour is. Or is it of capacity? Uh, yes, yeah, five dollars per kilowatt hour of uh, storage capacity. Um, I I need to to double check, but that's the reason why we're looking at salts, and actually that's one of the reasons why we want to move away from some of the strontium salts, right? Because they're very stable, but they're also very expensive. Um, but what we're trying to look at, which I haven't presented today, is can we use a little bit of the strontium salt with very cheap salts like magnesium sulfate, very widely available, that's just Epsom salt, or magnesium chloride or calcium chloride. But those salts have significant stability issues. Uh, but can we work with mixtures um, where we're able to benefit uh, from the stability of the strontium salt? Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, I had a couple of questions. So one related to your solar umbrella work again. So mm -hmm. what was the actual material that you used for building this? And I guess related to that is how do you envision scaling it up? Um, also, I asked because if you're thinking about um, doing this in a pond, for example, as you evaporate the water, the view factor gets worse and worse, right? right? So yeah. how do you account for all those things? Yeah, so we, uh, in this these particular experiments for the selective solar absorber, we used um, commercially available, uh, where is it? Yeah, for our selective solar absorber, we used um, what's called Tynox, um, which is, I think, one of the most widely used uh, selective solar absorbers. Uh, so we use that as our top surface. And for the infrared emitter, because we just did black body emission in this case, we just worked with a high temperature um, black paint that we were able to spray on and then anneal uh, to get this nice um, uh, emissivity of like it was 0.94 uh, for the black uh, paint itself. So that was this, you know, the whole idea was this should be really low cost and simple. And so that's why we worked with uh, these simple materials. In terms of the view factor changing, so that's definitely true. And uh, with, you know, design like this, where we call it this umbrella. Um, so this itself would need, uh, that distance would need to change. So you could just imagine, Almost like a, like a re regular umbrella, right? Where you could uh, pull it out more or um, that kind of mechanism in order to move this up and down as the water level changes. Okay, uh, thanks. Yep. And another question related to uh, the work that you presented that you're currently working on, where you have a condenser in conjunction with an evaporator for... Uh, mm -hmm water desalination so i know i'm aware of uh, some other related work in this area that uses uh, this concept of multi-stage solar still where they have several of these evaporator condensers and they um they have mm -hmm. a permeable membrane which pulls the liquid in evaporates typically using solar radiation mm -hmm. and the energy balance also basically looks very similar how is this work different from uh, some of those recent papers that came out? Yeah, so I mean, what we're really doing differently is there is no membrane in the process. It's only an air gap itself. Uh, and the reason we don't want a membrane is because we don't we are trying to operate at zero liquid discharge conditions rather than seawater desalination. So, we've worked with uh, having just a hydrophobic membrane here in the past, and we see, uh, again, the on your permeate side, over time, you'll see its conductivity jump up because essentially there is pore wetting from the membrane. So you end up just creating this pathway for 
your salt solution to directly feed into the permeate. Uh, so that's why we got rid of the membrane itself. And then the second thing uh, that we're doing uh, differently in this process is just working with these polymeric heat transfer surfaces rather than more traditional like metal surfaces. And so that would allow us to really have large scale devices that could still be uh, low cost. Great. Thank to, the, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think anyone has modeled how these perform as you go to zero liquid discharge. Most of it has been for seawater, whereas we are trying to show performance at these different operating conditions. Right. Yeah. I mean, the ones I'm aware of, they were all uh, related to just solar uh, seawater desalination, not right. zero, yeah. Not zero liquid. Yeah. So my, I think that a thermal process only makes sense for brine concentration uh, because like membranes cannot operate in this range. Otherwise a membrane process is much more efficient than a thermal process, right? Like reverse osmosis is very close um, to the actual thermodynamic limit. Whereas a thermal process is orders of magnitude more um, energy intensive. Right. Great. Uh, any last questions? Okay, if not, uh, well, thank you again for this wonderful talk.